Okay, so let's start our, our first panel. First panel, IP awareness survey, what a, a thousand Americans think. This survey was actually conducted by the USIPA, USIP Alliance. <clears throat> CIPU thought about doing this about five or six years ago. We didn't have the funds to do it. Uh, USIPA did, and uh, they did a very useful survey. It confirmed some things that were, were known, and um, it also, uh, there were some counterintuitive results as well. Uh, Elizabeth and her panel are going to talk about that, <clears throat> but really what I think she'll do uh, and they'll do today is where do we go from here? Th there is a, a lot of kind of disconnect, if you will, in the, in the IP space with regard to what people know and understand about IP rights. They understand a lot, but not as much as they think and it's not always accurate. But how do we address that? That is really what people in this room and others need to be thinking about. And Elizabeth, I'll introduce you and your panel to uh, take that further. Good morning, and thank you, Bruce. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this morning and to join in this sixth annual IP Awareness Summit. On behalf of our panel, we thank the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding and Northeastern University's Center for Research Innovation. I think our panel today is going to continue the conversation that Kara started so beautifully this morning. Uh, we are going to begin our panel today, surprise, with two lightning rounds of the game I like to call Famous Inventor or Pharmaceutical. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed we are. I'm going to give you two names one of which is a pharmaceutical, one of which is a famous inventor. And you as the audience get to tell me which is which. Our first li uh, lightning round, Belvic Bogardis. Your choices are Belvic and Bogardis. Who thinks Belvic is an inventor? Who thinks Belvic is a pharmaceutical? All right. This is a very knowledgeable audience because, in fact, that is true. Belvic affects chemical signals to the brain that controls appetite. Bogardus, a name we should all know, significantly advanced American architecture by designing and constructing buildings that combine structural strength and aesthetic beauty. His patent, number 7,337, extremely old, permitted iron buildings to be built with bigger windows because less of the surface area of a wall had to be devoted to load-bearing supports. Our second lightning round, Radara and Revest. Radara and Revest. Who thinks Radara is an inventor? Who thinks Radara is a pharmaceutical? Ooh, mixed response this time. Radara is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Revest. Ronald Revest and co-inventors created RSA cryptography, which is the world's most widely used public key cryptography method for securing communication on the internet. It is instrumental to the growth of e-commerce. RSA is used in almost all internet-based transactions to safeguard sensitive data such as credit card numbers. So why the game? One, because we love audience participation. Two, it also goes to our topic today, IP awareness, awareness of IP as a whole and those that work within the ecosystem. As Kara hinted at, few inventors are household names. Certainly there's a handful, Edison, Tesla, Bell. But how about the other 600 plus members of the National Inventors Hall of Fame? individuals who have at least one patent on a technology which has become so ubiquitous it has changed our world. In the words of NIF inductee and world change maker, Dean Kamen, in America, we have two obsessions. We celebrate sports heroes and entertainment heroes. There's no room left for kids to see even a little bit of the opportunities to really really get excited about becoming an inventor, an engineer, or a scientist, a problem solver. So where does that leave us? 
And what is our challenge here today? As Bruce has suggested, in a 2022 online survey of 1,000 adults, the U.S. Intellectual Property Alliance discovered that two-thirds of adults say they understand intellectual property protections. Surprisingly, that, that number is pretty significant. Of 1,000 respondents, two-thirds, 66%, said, yeah, they understand intellectual property. But yet, when pushed a little further with more explicit questions in the survey, few could articulate what a patent, trademark, copyright, or trade secret was. Their knowledge might be assumed to be a mile wide and an inch deep. A general recognition type of knowledge without a foundation of specificity or strong factual understanding. Perhaps they recognize the words or have seen the symbols indicating IP, but are not truly versed in what it really means. The survey additionally reflected that while individuals learn about IP through a variety of means, it's a little bit worrisome, high school civics class and the media are the two more, most prevalent sources for people learning about intellectual property. So with me today, I have three real experts to discuss the topic of IP awareness. I'll introduce them to you briefly, then Manny will kick us off, and each will speak from their perspective. We'll then take Q&A at the end. So seated in the middle of our panel, we have Dan Brown. Dan is an award-winning inventor, serial entrepreneur, educator, and innovation advocate. He is also a member of the USPTO Public Patent Advisory Committee. To my immediate left is Stephanie Couch. Stephanie is the Executive Director of the Lemelson MIT Education and Awards Program and an IP education expert. And last but not least, to my far left is Manny Schechter. Manny is Chief Patent Counsel for IBM and also serves on the Board of Directors for the CIPU. Manny, I'm going to turn the podium over to you, or you'd like to stay at your seat. Uh, is my microphone working? Got the thumbs up. Since we all have microphones, I thought we would probably all just sit here. Um, thanks, Liz. Um, I think the first thing that I wanted to do with this first segment is take a step back. Um, I know there's a lot of people in the room like me who've worked in the intellectual property field for a long time. So what I'm going to say in the next few minutes isn't going to be terribly new for them. But for the small number of people that are in the room that don't have much experience or are just learning about intellectual property, I think the first thing they might think of when they hear Liz say that this organization that many of us, including Liz and I, are part of, did a survey about what people know about intellectual property, they might think is, why did you do that survey? What was the purpose? And the first thing I would say is, those of us that are in the room that are more experienced, we've always had a suspicion a sense that most of the population don't have a deep understanding of intellectual property. We've seen the eyes of our clients glaze over when we try to explain something. Maybe even more troubling to us is we've seen the rolling eyes of the family members when they ask what we do and we try to explain them. I'm seeing lots of people going, oh yeah, uh, I know, this happens to us all the time. Um, Kara did a great job of talking about the divide, and I want to talk just for a second about a slightly different divide, and I don't mean to imply anything about the divide Kara described. I completely understand and agree. Um, but I experienced a different divide, one that I think is actually getting better, but still has a long way to go. and. I think one of our later panels may address. Um, and that divide for me goes back 40 years ago before I was an intellectual property attorney when I was graduating from engineering school. Um, I thought I'd been taught everything I need to know to go out into the world and to be an engineer. Um, mind you, 
not a single word in my college education about intellectual property, not one word. What's the first thing that happened to me when I went to work as an engineer? I was presented with an agreement governing, governing confidential information and intellectual property rights. So I had just barely stepped onto the job and I suddenly found out I didn't know enough. I didn't know what those rights were. I signed the agreement because it was that or, you know, no job. And the agreement was actually fair, so there was no harm done. But I couldn't help but think to myself, why hadn't I ever been taught anything about this? Um, that is another divide. It, that divide doesn't prejudice any particular part of the population except the people going through that education. Uh, so that worried me greatly when I saw that. Um, we've already heard that intellectual property is becoming more important. The economy is shifting towards uh, greater dependence on innovation. Just about everybody in this room by now knows from the things that have already been discussed, if they didn't know it before, that intellectual property is intended to promote innovation and creativity. Uh, it ha therefore has a increasing role in things like our jobs, the economy, our national security, our comforts of life, you name it. So it only stands to reason that if we, that we want a, an IP framework that is going to optimize the promotion of innovation and creativity. And if we want to do that, it only stands to reason we want people to understand more about it. It doesn't necessarily mean we need to have 100% of the people having the knowledge, the same knowledge as the IP lawyers, but perhaps more than we need. And as Liz said, we found out some things in the survey. And the survey, first of all, confirmed, I think, all those suspicions that we've had all our lives. That was no shock. But we did the survey also to see if we could find a path forward. Where do we want to head? Is there a weak, is there a part of the population that's particularly weak in their understanding or their awareness? Um, unfortunately, I don't think we found out that much in that regard, a little bit, but not that much. Um, but we need to figure out if going forward, maybe we need to do more survey to find additional pockets that will help us with a path forward, whether it's a type of IP or a part of the population or what have you. So I'll stop there. I know I get a chance to talk again a little later, but I wanted to make sure we had that sort of level set before we go forward about the survey. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Uh, Dan, I think you're going to uh, deliver some opening remarks. Sure. Test? Okay. Um, I'm gonna reframe it in a way. Uh, I find a lot of these discussions that I get involved in and uh, uh, the whole ecosystem of intellectual property, it's, it's amazing. I think the divide is uh, uh, really around perception and reality in the context of IP. As an inventor, I have a perspective on it, an educator. Uh, I see it about design, design the knowledge rivalry between existing knowledge and new knowledge. Invention is creation of new knowledge. I go further, innovation is how new knowledge competes. Metric of innovation is competitive advantage. The perception is that inventors are rich and all these new things are coming out and the reality is most patents go nowhere. The perception is that uh, inventors are omnipotent and they're, they're these lone wolf geniuses, but the reality is they, they tend to congregate in large companies that are afford to pay them and can finance them and the sole inventor is really a rare bird. Uh, the, the perception is that, you know, the American dream is still alive, as we discussed, or is it? And I actually started an American-made company to prove it was. And as to your surprise, I think last night, I said, I think I've proven it's not. Um, <laughs> that uh, the, 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 the ability to create and innovate and uh, perpetuate the success we've had in our country has been greatly diminished for a number of reasons. Uh, 
the legal system and expense. Uh, many times I find myself being judged or uh, looked at as for the quality of my work or my invention from people who've never invented anything. They may have a degree or in an area, and they say because they maybe have a technical degree in an area, then you know they have enough understanding to be a posita, which most people here would understand what that is. But the, the reality is that uh, the question of obviousness, which we were talking about earlier, is, is, is a perception in reality. And we use one standard of obviousness when we give a patent at the patent office, and I'm a part-time employee of it, I gotta be careful, but we use another standard when we take it away at the PTAB. And uh, small inventors are just losing their rights and the ability to raise money, to, to, to bring products to market has been tremendously impaired by that. So I'm gonna end with the perception of reality that we, we have this pathway and it's, it's fantastic and the ecosystem just has to educate more. I don't think, I think there's a lot more to it. And I spend my life educating people. Every one of my capstone teams file for patents. Many have gone to market. I, I understand that very well. But I think what I see a lot of is a bandwagon rhetorical effect on education, but not the real understanding of what it takes to, to explore and understand find a problem and, and, and really push it into that, what I call a white space it, that creates a competitive advantage. So perception and reality. Thank you, Dan. I think that's gonna be an interesting area for us to explore today, both with our panel and the audience, uh, but throughout the day's conversation. Stephanie? Yeah, I have some slides, so I think I might need to get clear here. The, the slides that I Oh, there we go. Okay, next si slide, please. The, uh, um, there we go. Is that going to do it for me? This one? There we go. Okay. I, I'm going to dig in just for a minute into some of the data that was in that um, survey. Now, in my past life, the beginning part of my career, I was an advisor to two of the speakers of the California State Assembly, and we, we read a lot of survey data. So anytime you'd see numbers like this with 65%, 64% um, agreeing that the ability to have a patent on one's creation or invention drives competitiveness, promotes innovation in the US, that's a really good statistic. Same with people understanding that anybody in America can, can be an inventor. So when I read these numbers, I'm like, what's the problem? Why are they worried about IP awareness? Just claim victory and go home. You know, but then I started digging down into the details of the break aparts. And when you say, okay, anybody can be an inventor, but can you be an inventor? Well, now we start seeing some differences when we look at gender, when we look at income, when we look at age. Can you get a copyright? Same differences, right? The, the divide that, Kara, we didn't plan our talks together, but that divide, you begin to see it in the breakouts of the data. And this is the one taking a cue from Clint Eastwood, good, bad, and ugly, which fewer and fewer people know what I mean. Um, you know, this is the one I worry about the most. The American dream is still attainable today and being able to own the rights of your creations or discoveries by obtaining a patent plays a critical role. If you're under 35, only 53% believe that the American dream is still alive. And I'm here today, not because I'm a lawyer or uh, have this love affair with intellectual property, I'm here because I think it's really important to live a life of meaning and purpose. And I wanna help young people across America live that same life of meaning and purpose and feel really good about what they're able to do. And so this idea that you can do that, um, being so low among our young people really concerns me. So our theme 
of building bridges, we have a lot of bridges to build here. We need to reach out. And one of the ways we do that is not just teaching about intellectual property, but teaching about how to be a creator, or as Dan said, how to find that white space where you can make a contribution that no one else to date has made. How you can help someone. I want kids to learn that, and then I want them to learn how to protect what they create. And I want everyone to feel a part of that, including young women, including those who come from uh, back family backgrounds with less income. So I had the opportunity to meet with the Commissioner Lee, who's the commissioner for the Republic of Korea, and um, was talking to them because the rates of, for example, uh, women who are in have a patent in the Republic of Korea are like twice as high as in the in America, and they're off the charts glo in global comparisons in terms of how many people are earning patents and the diversity of those who are in patents. And I said, how do you do it? So to put that into perspective, California has six and a half million school-aged children, and the Republic of Korea has about 5.8 million. They have 200 centers that are scattered throughout the schools. They start IP education in the elementary school years and continue across every grade span all the way through high school. And all students as part of the national curriculum are taught both computer science and, and IP. And there are electives to learn how to be an inventor. When I first started six and a half years ago, we found all these research studies. They were from Korea, and they were on invention education. So we have a lot to learn um, from some of the things happening outside the US. Um, so teachers need professional development. Uh, we need to organize technical mentors because the people who go into teaching are not doing it because they love STEM, right? They love kids, and we want them to love kids. And so we need to come to their aid with uh, the education of schools. And finally, the pro bono support. Um, I'm grateful to the USIPA for a campaign to reach a million students this year. I hope you jo join us on that, going into the schools, educating uh, students at all grade levels, including college, university, um, about the IP system. Uh, you know, we at the Lumelson MIT program work with high school teachers and teams of high school students that invent. It's a big lift for our teachers. The idea of teaching the students then how to protect their IP is just way over the top. So we rely on pro bono support from attorneys. And as a result, we can boast now that we've had 16 US patents awarded to high school teams, but largely thanks to that US uh, to the uh, pro bono support that we get from groups like Microsoft's Make What's Next. So, you know, um, we have a long way to go, and I'm hopeful that we can get there if we all work together. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for shining a light on some very uh, specific statistics, but also for your work in the space and your your positivity in knowing that we can change the playing field. Uh, so I think at this time, we're back to Manny. OK, thank you. Um, I'd now like to turn everybody's attention to some of the obstacles that I think hinder the education about intellectual property. Um, and in particular, I'll talk about briefly about four particular areas. Um, that doesn't mean there aren't others. Uh, I bet some of you can think of some that I don't mention. Um, but there are four that I often think of when I think about why don't people know more. Um, so the first one and has already been mentioned briefly by one or two people. And it's the complexity that intellectual property is. Intellectual property is hard. It's, it's, from between the law and the many processes, it's, there's a lot to learn, um, especially if you want to work in the field. Um, we've all seen examples in the media where the media gets patents, trademarks, and copyrights confused. 
We've seen the examples of, uh, for patents, for the title or something mentioned in the body of a patent being confused with what's actually claimed, what, what the patent is really about, or getting a filing date confused with a grant date, or applying hindsight, or whatever it is. We've all seen, you know, anyone experienced in the intellectual property world has seen that. So the first thing I think that is an obstacle is complexity. It's not easy to teach this stuff. Um, and it's not easy to get people to sit long enough to learn this stuff. A second obstacle, and I hate to say this, is us. It's ourselves. Um, sometimes we have to look at ourselves. When we talk about how to improve the intellectual property framework, it's always going to be, and this is, this is human nature, the protesters are the ones you tend to hear. You don't hear from those so much that believe in the status quo. You hear from those that think there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Nothing wrong with that. But sometimes when we do that and we want change, we use extreme examples to get our point across. We use strong rhetoric. And the public and social media get the wrong impression about the state of the system and how it works and whether it benefits the economy, right? So sometimes we are the problem. I think a third thing is a lack of centralization. Just heard Stephanie mention how Korea has a national curriculum for intellectual property. Fantastic. Um, I believe there are some other countries that do as well. Um, I'm no expert on the education system. There are people in this room that know way more about the education system in the United States than I do. But my impression in the U.S. is our curriculum in schools is more of a state and regional thing than it is a national thing. And that means if you want to make change, you have to approach a lot more parties than just the central government. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying we should change the education system or how curricula are set, but it's clearly easier to go to one party and make change than it is to go to dozens of them or more. Um, and then the final thing that I think is an obstacle to intellectual property education is, and this was also hinted at uh, already, is one size doesn't fit all. The education that a sixth grader needs is not the same as what a 12th grader needs, is not the same as what a law student or a business student needs, is not the same as what a business executive needs. That's not shocking, but the fact of the matter is it means we need curricula, we need strategies that are different for each of those groups. And they all need to be couched in a way that is directed to the targeted audience, that has the right strategy to break down the education appropriately for them. Um, so it, it's not just one curriculum. It's not just one strategy. It's many. And that just complicates things. And that's why, historically, what we've seen are a whole series of projects from IP organizations, from nonprofit IP organizations, um, whether it's USIPA or CIPU or many others, in how to go about attacking this problem. It's a very large issue, and each organization can only do so much. Um, I think what we're starting to see a bit more of is some banding together. I think that would be probably be helpful. But just like many other things in this space, we have a long way to go. And I suspect we'll hear more about that as the day goes on. I'll stop there for now. Manny, thank you for calling out for certainly meaty issues. And I respect that 
We've got a lot of intellect in this room, many of you who are already focused on these issues and others surrounding how can we do more, how can we do better uh, to change the innovation ecosystem, uh, particularly in the area of awareness and education. Um, I'm just gonna take a couple of quick minutes, uh, moderator's prerogative, uh, to talk very quickly about my role with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and some of the things we are doing as an agency, because in fact, it, this is about collaboration. Uh, and I also do want to call out the U.S. Intellectual Property Alliance, which, as we have said, uh, is the organization who hosted and sponsored the survey that we are focusing our comments on today. For those of you who aren't familiar with the U.S. IPA, it is still a relatively new organization but gaining ground very, very quickly. Uh, the USIPA considers itself a network of networks, connecting IP organizations, individuals, those working in the space across our networks to do more, to do better through collaboration. Um, there's not only the US Intellectual Property Alliance, they have now, now stood up a global intellectual property alliance as well as our standing up state IP alliances. Again, to have connections in our communities to grow awareness, education, and opportunities to feature and focus the world of intellectual property. You know, I think something that's coming out of our conversation today is in part the need to meet people where they are at. And our director, director Kathy Vidal, is very focused on that right now for our agency. Uh, and in that effort, with that focus, that key sharp focus, uh, she is heavily focused on reaching underrepresented uh, participants to the ecosystem. Uh, two particular uh, areas of, of activity are with her WE initiative, WE standing for Women's Entrepreneurship, where she is hosting a monthly uh, WE Wednesday uh, where she is bringing together remarkable speakers to talk about issues of not only intellectual property protection, but entrepreneurship itself, funding, and mentorship. There's a number of resources that have been gathered for women entrepreneurs, but of course they are really available and designed for anyone who's stepping foot into that realm. She's also very focused on her work in supporting the military, particularly military spouses, and people transitioning from the military into the world of entrepreneurship as they leave the military. Uh, she's very focused on that unique community as a source of, of great innovation uh, and one that uh, we should really tap into that, that hidden talent. Um, so just to, to call those out, the, the agency is certainly focused on being an agency of communication and collaboration. Uh, and just as, uh, Kara spoke to us this morning, we recognize that one of the strengths of our work is also in teaching through storytelling. And I'll use a story uh, speaking about one of our collaborators, uh, and that's the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Uh, you saw that Stephanie referenced them in those partners that are working to help provide education from K through 20. Uh, not only do we have our National Inventors Hall of Fame recognizing over 600 inventors, but we have Camp Invention, Club Invention, the Collegiate Inventors Competition. And I think one of my favorite success stories is one that takes place right here in Boston itself, and that's Nicole Black. Nicole Black has co-founded a company, earned her doctorate in materials science and mechanical engineering at Harvard, and landed a spot on Forbes 30 Under 30 list a real underachiever. Her journey as an innovator, much like Catherine, uh, began as a camp invention camper, so it began very, very early. She invented a, a broom that one didn't have to reach down to use the dustpan, and also a, a tool for collecting bugs so that you could safely take them out of the house and back into nature. She later went on to be a 2018 graduate winner in the Collegiate Inventors Competition. Today, she leads a team at Desktop Health to further develop a new material that can be 3D printed to match the architecture of the eardrum and other innovative 3D printed medical devices. 
Um, so just a, another example of what capturing that spirit to invent, that spirit to create in an early age can then lead to. Uh, last but not least, with respect to the US Patent and Trademark Office, I would call out to this audience, knowing that you come from across the nation and our online audience as well, is the resource that's known as our regional offices, located in Detroit, Denver, Dallas, and San Jose, and my team, which is at our Alexandria headquarters. Last year alone, we did over 600 educational programs, both virtual and in person, supporting inventors, innovators, entrepreneurs within our communities. So don't ever hesitate to reach out uh, to have the USPTO in your community. Uh, for those of you who have not had an opportunity uh, to read the Unleashing America Innovates Act, uh, which passed as part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of December 29th, 2022, you will note that uh, the USPTO has been directed by Congress to stand up an additional regional office to be located in the southeast region of the United States. They've identified 10 states. It should be located in one of those 10 states. So there will be a request for comments coming out in the not too distant future seeking cities, organizations, states to identify why they are the right location for that new office. We've also been directed by Congress to stand up community outreach offices, which is something completely new and completely different. Uh, but these will be coming in the not too distant future as well. But with that, I would like to turn back and uh, invite uh, questions from our audience I do have some prepared questions, but I'm sure your questions are much better than mine. You have three brilliant minds here in front of you. Please lend to the conversation about how can we address some of these challenges or address some of these opportunities to do more in increasing IP awareness across our nation and across the various demographics. Hello. Yeah, I'm Michael Bergman. I'm a patent attorney in the area, um, uh, past president of the BPLA. I, I'm wondering if there's not a target audience that you're omitting uh, in the sense of parents of these kids. Because I think my own experience, my dad was an engineer, and I, was ha I had alarm clocks to take apart by the time I was three, uh, neighbor teaching me about projects when I was four or five. Um, and so certainly in my experience, I was thinking about making stuff and inventing. I had the idea of inventorship before I got to elementary school. And certainly by the fourth grade, that's an interesting time and you should be talking to those kids. But I think uh, you might also want to think about having par who parents are interested in their kids. And if you can out reach out to the parents of these kids who don't have that opportunity, you may have a, an avenue for um, making a difference. Thank you, Michael. Would any of our panel like to share resources that are available for parents or how you perhaps as a parent have, have dealt with that? Is this working? Yes. Okay. So um, you're exactly right. And we have not really focused on the parent per se in our programming. And it's a real omission. We probably need to look more at parents. Um, I will say that um, we got some experience with that during COVID. There are some silver linings in COVID. Uh, one is we started an online program uh, with Biogen called Biotech in Action, and we show the intersections of how they make drug therapies and where invention comes in. We serve 450 kids, it's continuing to this day. Uh, but we met some parents that way, and uh, our, our faculty advisor, Professor Michael Seema, is very good because one in particular I'm thinking of, uh, uh, Juan Rafael's mother calls Professor Sima or emails him about once a month. And I think he's now taking him into his lab this summer. So <laughs> it's, it's, it can be powerful unleashing parents. Um, and the other is we were doing online, I don't know if you've heard of the, the Henry Ford Museum has invention conventions. And so we have been facilitating those in California and in uh, Massachusetts. And so during COVID, we were doing the lessons online. And you wouldn't believe how many parents joined their kids. They really loved it. So thank you for that. We'll have to focus on that. 
I would also add uh, the USPTO does have a wealth of resources on our website for teachers, parents, and students. Uh, but again, as Stephanie has suggested, we could certainly do more. It also makes me think of the homeschool market. There's an area that's really ripe for parent involvement in, in teaching. Uh, another question. Um, hi, good morning. I really appreciated all the comments from all of the panel members. Um, my name is Chinwil Hanale. I'm the senior program manager of Michelson Institute for Intellectual Property. Um, and I'm also a practicing um, IP attorney, but not in patents. Um, so my question has to do with a lot of the discussions that have happened so far in terms of bridging the divide. And I think the instinct is always to go to established institutions that already provide education like universities, community colleges, um, you know, the K through 12 um, pipeline. But what role do community organizations play, especially for communities that maybe traditionally don't get information from that pipeline? Um, I think we saw this in COVID as well when we were trying to get information out to different communities to come and get vaccines or get tested. You, the outreach had to be a little bit more diverse for different populations. And this goes back to a comment that was um, shared, you know, one size doesn't fit all, right, in terms of awareness. So for me, I think there's another piece in terms of, for lack of, of a better word, marketing to get the people into the conversation and then they can begin the education. So I wonder if there are any thoughts about how to diversify how we're communicating to different communities and sort of perking their interest um, so that they can understand that this is also for them. Panel, who'd like yeah. to jump in? Uh, I'll, I'll take this one. So um, there actually is a strong grassroots community of inventors um, throughout the country. Um, they're loosely organized. Some of them are really active, others are less active. Uh, they don't seem to break into the, the ecosystem. And I think as I reflect on it, that there's a lack of inventor voices in our ecosystem. Um, and what I mean by that is that uh, when I go to most of the events or whatever, I don't see other inventors. I see people from the bar, people that are administrators, et cetera, not many inventor voices. And, and, and I think if I were to reflect, if I was in the medical area and I was a heart surgeon, you, you wouldn't see the, the whole organization be run by non-heart surgeons or non-people that were not in the, in the game, so to speak. And I think we need more inventor voices in it. And that, that would come through the community and uh, in, into the system. Uh, there's a, and it's just the way it evolved, I believe, and because of the complexity uh, of intellectual property and how it plays out in the legal system. Uh, inventors don't break into that, those areas of responsibility or those areas of teaching, and we, we have a disconnect. I, when I, I see all the things on education and, and what invention is, I, I see a lot of rhetoric, uh, I see a lot of the same old stories, and, and I see, quite often just uh, a perpetuation of mythology versus what it really is to invent. And I don't know if we're gonna get to those inventors, the diverse in inventors, or spread it out and, until we, we get the rest of the ecosystem to have an empathy for what it is to be an inventor. Can I, add to that? I, I don't know if this will be terribly helpful, but I'll just try to add a little something. My general sense is whether it's the communities or the parents or whoever, it's getting them, it's not, it, it's getting them to know what the benefit is that kind of unlocks things. I, I can't say that from a great deal of experience, but I think most people, once they realize there's something in it for their children or themselves, will quickly try to embrace additional information about the subject. The hard part is getting them to see that benefit. I think we need to focus some attention there. 
Hi, uh, Myron Casaraba here at Northeastern at the Center for Research Innovation. So I guess my question is related to some of the other questions of, you know, how can we make greater efforts to sort of address the public perception of IP? I mean, there are probably equal voices to say that patents are bad. Um, we've seen with some of the drug pricing issues that people are putting that on buses in DC. Um, we also, I think, have uh, voices out there that say patents get in the way. So certainly I think this group believes that patents are good, uh, that patents can be valuable, but how do we turn and celebrate inventors the same way that we celebrate an athlete or celebrate an entertainer. I mean, Bob Langer should be the Michael Jordan of life sciences invention, um, but it doesn't seem like um, you know that's that's happening. So I think all of these groups are working on sort of preaching to those of us that are in the uh, in the field. But how how does it get elevated even even further? Oh. Two words. Super Bowl commercial. <laughs> no, no one's buying into that. So let's hear a real answer. Well, I'll just deal with one aspect of what you said, um, which was referring back, I, th I think, in part to my comment that sometimes we're the problem, that our own rhetoric, our own extreme examples can lead to misinformation and the situation that the gentleman mentioned where if pretty substantial portions of the population that believe the patent system is good and a pretty substantial portion not so confident. Um, and I think we may have even some discussion about that in another panel. But one thing I always try to do when I comment about imbalances or problems that I see in the patent system is not say the patent system is broken, not use extreme language that would, mis, would, would misguide people into thinking the patent system doesn't work. Yeah, there are problems and there are times where it breaks down. But the point is that in the overall, it's a system which promotes innovation and it largely accomplishes that objective. It fails at times. There are abuses at times. But we should couch our concerns about the system as improving that balance, trying to achieve a point that optimizes the economy, not say the system is broken, the system doesn't work, it's just worthless. Right. Those are the things that I personally try to do. I don't know if anyone else has another perspective. Oh, I, I would love to if I could. <laughs> I, and, and, and so two juxtaposition, very large organization, independent inventor, though you know, I got my master's at 50 and my PhD at 60, did my thesis on this. Um, the, the reality and uh, uh, perception of reality is that big companies, I think it's working well. But in the ecosystem for small inventors, it's not. And I, I would say that uh, uh, I think the best social system is a good job. And for companies to invest in their inventions and bring the products out in the states, they need to be able to protect it. And I'm not saying that theoretically I've done it. And uh, I'm going to tell you now that it, it's not it's not there to raise money to protect your patents. I've won willful infringement against two parties. And I don't know for the lawyers here, willful infringement is less than 2% of the cases. Very difficult to win. And two parties not found anywhere else that, that case happened. Three and a half million dollars of legal fees. It was my largest customer. It was a definite knockoff, smoking guns in the deposit. But you know, the, the, the reality is 40 people lost their jobs on that. And uh, I'm constantly fighting to try to uh, encourage people to create jobs in the states and use their intellectual property. But over and over again, I've just been so disappointed in that, you know, 
once you have success, and very few patents get successful, you put a target on your back. When that target gets on, there's a process of efficient infringement that not everybody's doing it, but there are enough that are doing it that just it's a cannibalistic system, we destroy it. And that, that to me is the biggest concern we have overall in the patent system. We need to get back to the system where we could protect our patents, we could raise money, we can get licenses, that there was more respect, particularly for the individual rights that uh, companies would not, you know, or companies, I was like, pirates would not just go out and steal it because they can. Hi, I'm uh, Tiffany Norwood. I'm one of those individual inventors, and I literally just got back from Geneva, Switzerland, speaking at WIPO around all of this stuff as well for World IP Day. Um, I think it's really important to and amplify what you were, were talking about, which is as an individual inventor, everything seems to revolve around the corporate innovation, uh, the technology transfer at universities, and uh, a lot of the narrative is dominated by pharmaceuticals, and yet, I and people like me and you are supposed to be the American dream. And I don't, I'm, I'm fighting my way for a seat at the table. It's been taking a long time, but finally over the past couple of years, I really have been able to have my voice be a part of the conversation, but it's so hard. It shouldn't be that hard. You know who we are because we file for the patents, we pay the money, you have our information, where's the reverse communication back to the individual inventors? Because a lot of the change that's happening is not as useful to us. And I'll give an example like what you were talking about. I'm an inventor, innovator, entrepreneur. I filed my first, uh, for my first patent at 19 as a teenager in the 80s. Um, and to your point, every single thing thing I've ever done as an inventor entrepreneur, as soon as it, someone smells the success of it, they steal it. Because, and as I got older, I've been able to defend it, but still, I mean, these are multi-billion dollar companies. Last fight I had went on for two years. My co-founder lost his home. We won eventually, but they, in the beginning of the fight, said, we're going to set aside a million dollars to our outside counsel to take your attack and put you out of business because we know you're vulnerable because of the Great Recession. They said it to my face, right? That's how bold it is. And what I said in Switzerland is what I'll say here, and it's reinforcing what you're saying, is that the laws are fundamentally broken if what we consider to be uh, respectable companies, this is a well-known brand too, right? Um, and even as a teenager with the first one track backpack, a well-known backpack company immediately stole it. They offered to buy the company. One of my co-founders didn't want to sell. And so instead of going away, they just took it. Our laws are broken. It, how can laws be working if what we consider reasonable players in the community, reasonable companies, reasonable brands, look at stuff and say, I will just take it because I know I can get away with it and there's no penalty. They, it, we can borrow from copyright, for example, to have more penalty, but we need to reinforce those laws that if, for example, if there's uh, activity where you come to buy someone's innovation and they say no and then you go and do it anyway, well, that's intentional violation. Maybe there should be criminal penalty associated with that. People feel very comfortable stealing from us. Very comfortable. Like, it's as if the laws don't exist, especially so, on the patent side. So I don't want to interrupt you, but I... I don't know if everybody is aware of this, in, in both copyrights and trademarks, it was uh, lobbied by Sonny Bono, actually, in, in the uh, industry in Congress, where our, our laws come from, that willful uh, copyright and trademark uh, violations can be criminally prosecutable. But guess what? In patents, they're not. Uh, we don't have the lobby, we don't have the money, small inventors, to, to get that kind of legislation. And, and the reality is that that's a license to steal, as you have experienced, because this efficient infringement is a business model. And in Bloomberg, two years ago, there was an a executive at a very large tech company, I won't use the name, said that he felt that uh, that it was his fiduciary responsibility to f infringe a patent and let the courts sort it, sort it out. Well. If you're the person that invented the swipe 
and uh, other people are using it, where are you going to come up with that kind of money to do that? Uh, contingency fee lawyers, I mean, it's, it's, it's become such a negative uh, outcome for inventors that it's impossible to, to get through the court system. And now with the PTAB, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm hopefully we're trying to reconcile things, uh, you don't even get your day in court anymore. You can lose all your rights, and, uh, and I think from an obviousness situation, we have one standard of obviousness when we give a patent and one when we take it away. And I, Kathy and I talk about this a lot. <laughs> I traveled with her all last summer listening to inventors, and she's actually done a great job. And, and I guess I'm going to do a, a shameless plug for her. Um, she came out with an advance notice for potential new rulemaking, which is dealing with some of this. And immediately, uh, an IP watchdog last Friday, a group came up and started attacking her, saying she's walking out beyond her re roles and responsibilities, when through Arthrex, she was doing exactly what the Supreme Court said. And in the AIA, she has specific written uh, authority to do that. She's going to get a ton of heat now because she is now standing up for underrepresented inventors. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Tiffany. Uh, I think as we're coming to quickly recognize, there's no easy problems to solve. Uh, is our time together as a panel? Oh, there's an additional question? Okay, great. Hi, um, that last question touched the nerve, apparently. Um, just getting back to sort of the main topic, uh, I'm Dan Dardani, and I'm a director of licensing at Duke University, but was at MIT and took transfer for a number of years, but I also helped teach a survey course in intellectual property at Harvard Summer School for almost 20 years. One of the things that we learned when bringing IP education to the masses is the story cannot only be about patents. And I think what I'm hearing today is our tendency, because I am also technical and kind of slip into the patent side, you know, we have to remember that when we're talking to the general public, uh, and our course at, at Harvard was for all folks, lay people as well, um, the messaging cannot just be invention, invention, you know, because that only appeals to a certain small subsection of the demographics of the world. Um, but when you talk about that intellectual property also includes copyrights, which include expressions of ideas and art and photographs and music. And we had all those people come to that class because they were curious about, well, what does it mean when I create a TikTok video and what exactly are going to be the rights that go into the music that I edit to go into that? Or, you know, we had all, whole different kinds of, of folks take that class. And we led with copyrights. We didn't lead with patents because we didn't want to immediately sort of, you know, force upon them the technicalities of patenting. And I think we have to remember that if we're going to increase awareness of intellectual property, there's a much richer sort of palette of stuff to, to lead with that will invite more people to get interested, younger, sort of older graduate students, because they're all coming into this with their own interest and what they want to pull out of it. And it's not always you know, PhDs, researchers who are trying to protect technical inventions. Thank you for that reminder and one that we need to all take to heart. So we started our panel with a couple of lightning rounds and I'd like to invite our panel to close us out with a couple of lightning rounds. Uh, I'm gonna ask a question. Uh, they don't know this is coming. Um, and ask each one of them to provide their thoughts. Uh, who can serve as the best advocates for IP and why? And I'll start with Stephanie. Yeah, um, you know, increasingly we have young people who are getting copyrights, earning patents, et cetera, and I really think we need to start using them to message to their peers. Uh, we try to involve a lot of uh, peers in the programs that we, that we offer, so I, I think that's one. The other, just to sort of close out on sort of this, this rift that we were just uh, enjoying. <laughs> you know, I, I think also we ought to not sugarcoat uh, the issues. Uh, I have had uh, three high school boys, and they love a good fight, and so do their friends. And let's have the great debate. I was in the debate league when I was in high school. What a wonderful debate topic this would be. You know, let's let's force the kids to get in and have these dialogues and have these issues. Let's not hide the reality from them. 
Going to go down the road here, row. Uh, Dan, you're up next. Okay, I'm going to keep it short because I've dominated things. Uh, uh, I think bringing in the community more in inventors and, and creators into the process, uh, stop spending money on uh, more, say, law school seminars, which is what I'm advocating at the at patent office. We have plenty of practitioners who know it but spend more money at the, the ground roots, the grassroots of people doing it and bring them into the, the, the system. The one thing the, the inventors groups lack is money and coordination and that effort. And, and, and I'm, I have to acknowledge, sometimes you, you meet an inventor and it's always not a pleasurable experience because of their passion or lack of knowledge or whatever. But many of the inventors, independent inventors, are, are really you know uh, hardworking people running other lives, they don't have the time or money or effort to get into it, but bring them into the conversation, get them into the schools, get them into the community groups. They, they typically have a lot of experience they can share. I think your question was who can best serve as an advocate for IP? Correct. And my answer would be there is no one person. It depends on the audience we're trying to reach at a particular moment. It might be a parent when you're trying to reach a child. It might be uh, a superstar inventor or, or, uh, or an author if you're teaching about copyright. We need to stop thinking that there's one group that's going to solve the problem. There might be one group that's going to solve a small portion of the community problem, but I don't think there's one single best advocate for IP. Great answers. Uh, we've got one more, a lightning round, and that is, if you could empower our audience, this is your chance to give a call to action. What would you ask our audience to do in their community, whether it's their geographic community, or their professional community, or their personal community? What would you ask them to do to increase IP awareness? Is it use of a certain tool? Is it use of, uh, I, I leave it up to you. And we're gonna start with Manny this time and work back down the row. Um, I'm betting we have at least a small number of people here from social media. I think social media is in incredibly influential today, which I think we all know that, and it's particularly influential on our youths and in the community. And I would plead with the social media, when you run stories on intellectual property, knowing how complex it is to put in the extra effort to make sure that the confusion factor isn't included in the story and to make an extra effort to make the story, I know it's hard to do this and keep it simple, but to make, or keep it brief, but to make the story as simple as possible so that the messages about intellectual property truly get across. It's often like two kids fighting in the back seat of a car, right? <laughs> uh, I'd say that if uh, in your community, if you're looking for jobs and economic development, you need to reach out to your legislators and let them know that intellectual property rights are fundamental to it and that they have to support it in a, in, in a much better way than they're doing now. It's a bit of a follow the leader, typical uh, political type system when I, I see bills come up. Uh, uh, we can do all the work on diversity and all the work on education, but if fundamentally if those rights cannot be protected, what are we going to tell the new diverse inventors when they get steamrolled by efficient infringement and that type of thing? We, we really have to reconcile it, I think, in Congress, and Congress will listen to the community, I believe. Yeah, I think um, this is another one of those where there's no one thing that is going to be the, the magic solution here. Um, we need people to go into classrooms, into college uh, offerings, college events. We need to keep and be vigilant as we have been, but step it up a bit in educating um, through different 
uh, ages, especially as we saw in those numbers, um, reaching audiences who are under 35 who just aren't uh, convinced right now that this world is for them or that it's uh, something that they can be a part of. Um, I think it's especially helpful. Uh, you know, I point to the positives. Uh, I can't say enough good things to thank Biogen for partnering up with us and helping us have an online program that is reaching uh, between summer and fall over 800 students around the globe every year now for three years. Um, showing young people how they think about the development of, of their drug therapies, uh, where um, uh, invention comes in, where their, where their trademark copyrights come in. They, they educate what the college and career paths are, what this could be for them, and then advising them on their ideas for where, what they could create, what research they could do. You know, um, it's going to take more of that. It's not a drive-by one time I'm going to teach you about IP and I'm going to walk away and now you have something for life. It's more about expanding the ways in which we're demystifying how young people can come into those big buildings that they don't know anything about those black boxes, bringing them in through a more meaningful programmatic effort, in my opinion. Before I turn it back over to our host, Bruce Berman, I want to thank you for being a fantastic audience. Thank you for your participation in our panel and ask you to also thank our panel, Stephanie, Dan, and Manny, for sharing their expertise and sharing their wealth of knowledge, uh, a diversity of answers and diversity of information that I hope uh, you've got a number of takeaways to take with you today. Thank you.